on this beautiful Melbourne day. My name's Jonathan Marsden. I'm the chair of the Metropolitan Transport Forum, and who is the host of the meeting in conjunction with the magnificent city of Whitehorse. And hey. I'll... <laughs> there we go. And Andrew's a big fan, as you know. But I'd, I'd like to start with an acknowledgement that, and that the Whitehorse City Council acknowledges the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung people of the Kulin Nation as traditional owners of the land we are meeting on and we pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging and all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders from communities who may be present today. The First Nations people have travelled and traded over these lands for more than 3,000 generations and I'd like to recommit the Metropolitan Transport Forum to truth-telling and reconciliation with our First Nations people. Thank you for joining us tonight, both in the room and on live stream. We're live streaming with, with captions to eventually to YouTube, so you'll be able to catch up on, all, on the replay or share it with your friends in the next few days. I'd like to acknowledge a couple of councillors here tonight. My, my colleague, uh, the delegate to the Metropolitan Transport Forum, three times mayor, which makes you mayor emeritus. Uh, now, councillor Andrew Munro, thank you for being here and thank you for hosting us. And similarly, councillor Amanda McNeil, thank you for being here tonight as well. You are very gracious hosts in providing us this space to, to have this important community discussion. I'd also like to acknowledge other activists and candidates who are not at the front table here tonight. Thank you for all you do for our local thriving democracy here in, in Whitehorse. Before I introduce our speakers, I'd like to outline the format and the ground rules for tonight's forum. First and foremost, this is a transport forum. So really that's what we're here to talk about and, and consequently that's what we will be asking questions about. So anything else not concerned with transport is, it won't be under discussion tonight. The other thing is it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a panel, it's a Q&A. It's a chance to hear from the candidates primarily. This is a, a way of understanding what they're thinking and what their policies and aspirations are for the city, uh, rather the seat of Box Hill. Um, so it's, it's not a town hall meeting and to that end um, we'll invite each panellist to speak for up to six minutes initially on their perspective on local and metropolitan transport issues. We have Greg Day, who's the organiser of this forum series, who will be timing the speakers. He's very handy with a bell. And one bell when you've got a minute left. And two when it's all over. So j just, just to spell that out again, one minute remaining sounds like this. And when time is up, you get two bells. At about seven o'clock, we'll start the Q&A part of the evening. And at that time, we'll ask people with a question to make themselves known and I'll invite one person at a time to ask a question. Um, and, and please limit your remarks and question to less than one minute. It's really important we smash as many questions as we can in, in order to hear from the candidates themselves. So please no speech making. And we have one microphone and to that end, Chris Hui, who works for the City of Whitehorse, he's the transport guru. It will be running the microphone up and down the place. So we will be alternating between the audience and then getting the, the candidates to answer each of the questions in turn. Um, you, you, you may direct your question to, to one candidate, but all candidates will have the opportunity to answer. So even if you are interested in only one person's opinion, the, the other two will also get to speak on that question. And we'll give each panellist one minute to respond. So to reiterate, during the Q&A session, one minute to ask a question, one minute to respond so we can get through as many questions as we possibly can. We've got a decent crowd here tonight and online and it's important that we get through as many as we can. At about 7.45, we'll invite each panellist to make final remarks of up to two minutes. All of this is being live streamed and recorded and will be available on the Metropolitan Transport Forum website in the next day or so. Metropolitan Transport Forum, by way of introduction, is a group of 26 Metropolitan Councils who advocate and network, share information and, and in this case host these events to facilitate a conversation around transport and to keep those responsible accountable. But now it's time to hear from our panel. We have three speakers tonight. The first of all is the current MP for Box Hill, Mr Paul Hamer representing Labor Party. 
Thank you, Paul. <laughs> We're also joined by Nicole Dae Werner, who is the Liberal candidate for Box Hill. Welcome, Nicole. <laughs> and our third, I was going to say contestant, uh, <laughs> is Ave Puglielli, who is the Greens candidate for North Eastern Metropolitan Region. <laughs> and thank you for being here, Ave. So we drew cards a few minutes ago to determine the order of speakers. I believe, Nicole, you drew the first card, then Ave the second, and, and Paul the third. What, what I'll ask you to do is come up to the, the lectern to deliver your six-minute opening address, and then to... And then in the Q&A, we'll, we'll sit down and take those questions. So I'd like to, to welcome Nicole Dae Werner, Liberal candidate for Box Hill, to the microphone. You're starting the table? OK. Well, good evening, everyone. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today, the Wurundjeri Woi Wurrung people of the Kulin Nation. We pay respects to their elders past and present and to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people present today. Thank you for being here tonight. My name is Nicole Dae Wern and I'm the Liberal candidate for Box Hill and it is my pleasure to be here. I will be the first to say that I am not a transport expert. I've never pretended to be. The truth is an elected representative's job is not to be an expert in all fields. Their job is to listen and to represent and serve their local community. My background is in the community and charity sector. That's grounded me with a desire to make a difference. I'm a firm believer that politics is about people. So is transport. Transport is about providing the services and amenities that the people of Box Hill and Victoria actually need. To that end, I've been listening to and consulting my community, the place where I was born, grew up in and still live in to this day in order to best represent them as their voice for Box Hill. There is a pace of development around Box Hill that necessitates transport solutions, cheaper and quicker solutions, not expensive propositions that don't have business cases that stack up, that blow out in both cost and in time. I have a vision to make transport planning boring again. What I mean by this is that transport planning and policy should be expert-led and evidence-based. For too long, we have seen transport and infrastructure be about pure politics. What's politically advantageous? What will win votes? For too long, the current government has favoured infrastructure over service, i.e. ribbon-cutting projects over the actual service needs of our community. A good government is not one that stands for projects first and people last. A strong government is one that listens to its people, delivers on services that their community need and has a plan for Victoria. So here is our plan for transport in Box Hill and beyond if we are successful as a Liberal Nationals government. Firstly, a flat fare of $2 for public transport and $1 for concession. Infrastructure Victoria has been calling for lower transport fares because their research has found that it will drive up public transport patronage, help get cars off the road, improve with congestion and reduce emissions. They have found that low income households will benefit the most from this saving. This policy helps not just with transport but with the rising cost of living that we are all facing in the biggest public transport fare reduction in Australian history. Number two, we have a plan for free public transport for nurses and healthcare workers. Three, to extend the Route 48 tram from Baldwin North to Doncaster connecting the east. Four, a new express bus service to connect Glen Waverley and Box Hill from station to station with Deakin along the way to help ease road congestion. Five, our $10 billion roads plan. Fixing local roads, including ones I've advocated for locally, like Belmore Road in Mount Albert North and the pedestrian crossing on Blackburn Road. Six, auditing and reviewing any major projects over $100 million, including Union Station. And finally, shelving the controversial SRL suburban rail loop to instead spend on our broken health system including commitments of $108 million for the Box Hill Hospital precinct with 800 new car parks, $8 million for the Box Hill Community Health Centre and a $400 million upgrade for Maroondah Hospital. 
In 2015, Infrastructure Victoria was created as an independent advisory body tasked with developing Victoria's first ever statewide 30-year infrastructure strategy. I have it here with me today. It's 300 pages. And in all 300 pages, there is not one statement about the SRL. The Victorian Auditor General has confirmed that the business and investment case for SRL does not stack up. This was already the finding of the Parliamentary Budget Office. The Auditor General has slammed the Andrews government's premature commitment to funding this mega project without a robust economic analysis. This is alongside the project being widely criticised by independent transport infrastructure experts who keep saying that the SRO figures simply do not stack up and are a recipe for disaster. To date, Infrastructure Australia does not consider the SRL a priority project and have not undertaken a review of this business case. The truth is that the SRL will only return 51 cents on every dollar invested. It will lose Victoria money at a time when we have the highest debt of any state in Victoria, Australia. The SRL will cannibalise future transport infrastructure spending for generations. It simply does not stack up. The lack of any credible expert-based advice in support of the SRL is why I am committed to Box Hill and to responsible, evidence-based, expert transport policy for our electorate. For Box Hill and beyond, we have a plan. We'll consult our community and we will deliver on service. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. The next speaker is Aif Pugliely, the Greens candidate for the North Eastern Metropolitan Region. Please, Aif. Thank you, everyone. Um, as was just stated, I'm Aif, the Upper House candidate for the Greens in North East Metro, the broad region that covers um, areas including Box Hill, where we are now. Um, I also would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we are meeting tonight, the Wurundjeri Wurrung people of the Kulin Nation, acknowledging that this is stolen land, unceded land, and that sovereignty was never ceded. And I think in this conversation around transport, it is incumbent on us to remember that we are on land uh, where First Nations people, First Nations cultures have, have moved themselves around from A to B, have travelled, transported themselves for literally tens of thousands of years, a time that we probably can't even fathom. And so then when we have these conversations around big infrastructure projects that um, address our transport needs today, it is incumbent on us to respect that careful country and those cultures that were here before colonisation. And when I look across North East Metro and more broadly the state of Victoria, in many instances I just see how far off track that mindset has become. We, at my way, I'm based from Eltham, I'm an artist based out that way. Uh, North East Link is a key example where we just see a scar ripping through a suburb, tearing it apart. And as was just raised by Nicole, projects that are proposed that do not seemingly have adequate evidence-based approach as to why they are in place. And events like tonight, I think, are really crucial in where we can listen to you, the people, for your feedback and for your thoughts and questions on those projects and how they're going to be implemented, how they're going to be serviced, how they're going to address your needs for transport. And as, as was raised just before me, this idea while I'm speaking here tonight, it is really to listen to you. And I do want to give a shout out to Joanne Shan, who's in the front row here, is our candidate for the Victorian Greens in the seat of Box Hill. She's an excellent listener, really 10 out of 10 person. I encourage all of you after these speeches tonight to speak with her and again, address your concerns, ask questions, because she is the person that's going to be representing you at the lower house level at the ballot box. The Victorian Greens, when it comes to transport, effectively operate under the core idea which is the reality of transport as a sector in Victoria is quickly becoming our fastest emitting sector in the state. And so everything we do has to keep that in mind. I'll outline what is essentially the three core pillars of our transport offering for going to this election, just to give you a bit of an oversight. And then I'm sure in the questions we will go into specifics on key projects, so I'm looking forward to those questions. It is really humbling being in the room with so many people with lots of expertise, I'm sure, when it comes to the idea of transport. 
The first key idea is our public transport existing infrastructure, getting the best bang for buck out of the services that we currently have and making sure that they are fitting the needs of the community. So when it comes to, say, train lines, for example, our off-peak times, particularly out my way, but as is the case on many lines within North East Metro, we might see uh, trains moving at arriving every 20 to 30 minutes. In the Greens proposal going into this election, we're looking at a 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., 10 minutes consistent delivery of service. That gives the community con uh, the consistency and the assurance that when they go to the train station, there's going to be something arriving on time. That kind of a consistency across the board, enabling us to, when we have to get from A to B, go shopping, go do our work, that we can rely on that service to be functional and to be there and be accessible to us. It also, more broadly, intersecting with those lines, we, we have announced 3,000 solar buses to add to the existing fleet, renewably powered and built from a basis of community consultation as to their placement, their access and their service, because it's important that we have these conversations in a genuine, good faith, two-way direction with you to make sure that what new services we do implement are addressing your needs and your concerns and are things that you're going to actually use. Otherwise, what's the point? Um, the second key pillar comes to from the private modes of transport that we have, um, electric vehicles. Now, broadly within this idea of what we understand electric vehicles, one key aspect is charging stations is often a question that will come up. Within our current uh, election offering, we're looking at adding at least 1,000 new charging stations, again, placed with community consultation across the board so that we can give assurance to people who are buying electric vehicles and making that transition from a fossil fuel powered car to an electric car that they are going to definitely be able to charge it when they're going about on the travels, even if it's not in their day to day regularity. Um, when it comes to electric vehicles, we've also been talking a lot at the moment with recent announcements about solar cars. It's a relatively new technology being used elsewhere in the world, which effectively turns your car into a battery to work two ways between your day to day commute back to your home so that you can have that two way transfer of renewables power which then again alleviates this pressure of where are the stations that I'm going to charge, it then connects it with your home. So those two things work in complement with each other. Um, and that then brings me to the price of the, on that front. We are looking at an eco bonus of up to $15,000 for existing car owners of fossil fuel vehicles to transition to an electric car, because often the access point on price is a key issue. The third pillar is the idea of active transport. And I will preface, there is an announcement yet to come in this campaign on this issue, so keep your eyes and ears peeled. Um, but cycling, walking, making sure that our communities are accessible and we can actually get around in a way that is both healthy for us and the environment. These three pillars intersecting with each other offers a vision for a future of Victoria that does not destroy our environment, does not destroy the community, does not pollute our waterways and the air that we breathe, but also services what is a growing state of Victoria to service adequately that public transport and these non-polluting modes are going to be the more enticing option than driving a fossil fuel powered car to where we uh, need to be, be it work, shopping, what have you. I thank you all for having me here tonight. Look forward to your questions. Thank you, Ave. And our third speaker in this six-minute introductory session is Paul Hamer, MP, the MLA for Box Hill, representing the Labor Party. Paul, please. Uh, thank you all. And um, can I also start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting today? Um, as part of the big build, Labor government, Andrew's government is investing more than $14 billion in roads and rail infrastructure in Melbourne's east. North East Link, suburban rail loop, metro tunnel and upgrades to local roads will significantly improve the way that Melbournians, and particularly people in the Box Hill electorate, will get around each day by reducing travel times, improving safety and improving reliability. The suburban rail loop east from Cheltenham to Box Hill will connect major employment, health, education and retail destinations and provide a direct and fast, direct, fast and reliable public transport connection between Box Hill and the eastern and southeastern suburbs. It was promised in the lead up to the 2018 election and more than $2 billion has already been committed to this project through planning, design and early works contracts. The suburban rail loop will deliver a reduction in road congestion and travel times 
greater access to jobs, health, education ser and services across the eastern suburbs, more employment opportunities closer to home and up to 8,000 direct jobs during construction. When we think about the suburban rail loop, we have to also think about what our city will be like in 30 years' time. Population projections say that mid-century Melbourne will be, have a population of 8 to 9 million people. We have to work out and build the infrastructure today to make sure that we, we, we can get around at, um, at that time in the, in, in the future. When I was studying, I was, I, 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 for a time I worked down in the southeastern suburbs and I also studied down at Monash for a time and it was very difficult to get to from the eastern suburbs. Very long bus trips, multiple bus trips to get there and to get back. And the, the common refrain from everyone down there, well, why isn't there a train to Monash Uni? Why isn't there a train to the airport? Because we didn't build it at the time. If we don't, build, if we don't go and build that, build this infrastructure now, we won't be building it perhaps ever, perhaps never for, for perhaps ever, or perhaps not for um, uh, this generation. What will that mean for Melbourne when, it, when it's a city of eight to nine million people? The eastern suburbs already has a high concentration of jobs, more, con more jobs in the eastern suburbs than there are in the CBD. Yet people are reliant on bus transport and, uh, to, to, and solely bus transport to get around, which relies solely on the existing road network and the congestion that is. With more people, that's going to be more congestion. So we need to have public transport solutions that can, um, that, that, that can accommodate that, uh, that particular growth. In terms of the, um, the, the, there's been a lot of, a lot of talk about the, uh, the business case. And I did want, and I hope that uh, there's been, um, uh, that Nicole's taken the opportunity to actually look at the full business case. Uh, which, was, which was prepared for the department, which actually explained why the discount rate was used for, um, in, 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 in how it generated a, uh, a positive benefit cost ratio. And the discount, a lower discount rate was used um, because this is, this is a fairly standard approach that is used on um, multi-generational transformational projects. Uh, it was used in the case of Inland Rail, an Australian government uh, uh, project as part of their, their project appraisal. And if there is a concern about the discount rate that was used, then we should also question, and I hope Nicole questions, her, um, the, the opposition's commitment to the Baxter electrification. So the Baxter electrification was, a, was, was announced as a policy commitment in 2018 by the Liberals and again last week by the Liberals. That has a return on investment far less than what the suburban rail loop is. The, um, the, report, uh, the report said it was the poorest economic outcome. So you can't have, it on, you can't have one side saying, well, we, we, we have to look at all projects and, have to have, and everything is based on that merit and then go out and announce the projects that, uh, that, 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 that suit you. So the suburban rail loop is a project that's needed because we need to look over the future. For too long, we only look at what's the immediate four-year or eight-year plan, and we want to decide what, what does our city going to look like in 30 years' time, and how are we going to get around, how are we going to get to the jobs in the future, how are we going to, how are we going to be able to get to the services that we need in, in the future. We're also investing in the services. It, it's, not just, it's not just about uh, local transport infrastructure, it's also about the services. Over $500 million invested in public transport services uh, since the Andrews government came to power in 2014. In the last budget, $109 million in improving local bus services. Uh, locally, we've been able to improve the service levels on the Route 302 and 304 along Belmore Road to get into the uh, for, for better access to the city, particularly in in peak hour. And uh, with the 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 2022-2023 budget has also allocated funding for more uh, for better services on those north-south routes, uh, the Middleborough Road service uh, and the Elga Road service through um, Deakin Uni and through to, um, to Monash Uni as well. Um, on active transport, we've completed the Box Hill to Ringwood path. Uh, we've developed a feasibility study for the Box Hill to Hawthorne path. 
A vote for the Andrews Government on November is a vote for better transport and uh, infrastructure and services. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paul. So now the Q&A begins, but I just want to check in with the audience um, just to make sure that the, first of all, the temperature's okay. I was told to keep an eye on the temperature, everyone comfortable? Um, the, the lighting, uh, pe people can see and hear everything properly. If, if anyone has any special needs that haven't yet been accommodated or would like a question and would like to just make it known that it's going to be difficult to ask that question, then I'd um, make yourself known to me or to my colleague, Jane Waldock, or to Chris Hui, who will be running the microphone. So just, just to, to give you the opportunity if, for you or your carer to make yourself known. The aim is to get through as many questions as possible. Obviously, with three minutes at this end and one minute from the audience, that's four minutes for a given question plus a bit. And we want to wrap up by about 7.45, so that gives us 50. So how many is that? About 12, 13 questions, in other words. So I'll stop speaking and we'll, we'll get amongst it. I'll ask you to raise your hand if, it, if, it, if you have a question and then I'll get Chris to run you the microphone. He, he then will run the microphone back to the front table so that the candidates can speak in turn. What we'll, we'll do initially is go um, Paul, Nicole, Ave, and, and then I'll, I'll mix up the order for the next one. So I, I'll, I'll, I'll go with the, the, the woman in the third row for the time being. Um, please ask your question. I've got a question for both Labor and Liberal. Um, at the end of the Liberals' um, period of government, the Labor Party subsequently spent $2 billion on cancelling a major road project that they had. It sounds as though if the Liberals get elected at this election, we'll spend a comparable or even greater amount on cancelling the rail project. For how long do we have to put up with this wasting of money and not having a bipartisan approach to long-term planning of our, our public and road transport systems? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, if I can put your mind back to the uh, 2010 to 2014 period. Um, so prior to 2010, um, uh, Ted Bailey was asked on radio um, whether the East-West Link would be built, and he said no. Um, when Dennis Napthine came, came in, um, it was uh, his proposal to build the East-West Link, and um, before any contracts were signed, the uh, Daniel Andrews said um, that they wanted to take it to the election because it hadn't been talked about previously. Um, and uh, several months after that, the Liberals signed the contract weeks before the caretaker. In this current, for, in, in the comparison with SRL, Suburban Rail Loop was put to the election in 2018. Um, there was not a there was not a, had not been a cent that had been that had been spent by that time. Since then, two billion dollars had been spent. Thanks, Paul. Nicole. Thanks very much for your question, and and really that's what I am standing for here today. We know that through the Andrews government, there have been cost blowouts of over thirty point seven billion dollars on trans, uh, uh, sorry on infrastructure projects. Thirty point seven billion dollars when the state debt is at one hundred and sixty point seven billion dollars the most in Australia, the most which makes us more than, uh, even if you were to combine New South Wales, South Australia and Queensland together, we're still more than them. So this is a, an absolute issue that you're talking about in terms of government wastage and this blowout of spending money. Uh, that's something that I want to stand for uh, and that we want to we want to help redress and look at it if we are to be successful. Uh, you're coming from the perspective also of why don't we work, work uh, in a bipartisan manner. Well, correct. I'm from the community sector. I haven't grown up in politics. I haven't been a staffer. I haven't been in the public sector. I've been in the not-for-profit sector. I think so too. I think that our... That's the end. <laughs> I'll, I'll stay to time. Thanks, Nicole. Eve. Thank you also for your question. Um, uh, look, I... I think often every election season we get the, the bold glossy promise and it's whether or not one side or the other likes that promise when as you've raised we do need to see the discussion around transport be informed by 
people such as yourselves, people with expertise, people in the community, so that we make sure that what we are implementing services the need and request of that community so that it is built together by and for the community. Um, Cost, of course, is a factor to discuss. I mean, when we look at projects that are currently proposed, and I do note we are likely to see a return of an Andrews Labor government, that's the political reality. In that context, we need to be asking the hard questions about how is it funded? How is it servicing the community? Is it accessible? Does it meet community standards and requests? And that's why it's great having you all here tonight because we need to actually have that conversation. Are you happy with what's proposed? What would you like to see changed? Thank you. Thanks, Eve. I'm going to switch sides and get questions from people of all ages, backgrounds and genders. So um, I'll, I'll go with the man in the mask at, on the fourth row. Thanks. Uh, th thank you. Um, Nicole, given that you've talked about debt, uh, it's estimated that the cost of the Liberals' pledge to cap PT projects is about $1.5 billion in lost revenue. And it might cost more given that the Liberals haven't actually released the costings from the PBO on the policy. Uh, the Liberal Shadow Treasurer, David Davis, has said, and I quote, foregone revenue means less options in public transport elsewhere, end quote. Transport policy experts agree that cutting hundreds of millions of dollars uh, in revenue will lead to degraded services and lack of investment in public transport, especially for our outer suburbs, which will make inequality worse and people more car dependent, which is a bit interesting given what you said in your six minutes, and I have read the entire 30-year plan. My question is, when, when will the Liberals release the PBO costing of the policy and when even the Public Transport Users Association, of which I am a member, thinks that this is a bad policy that will actually harm PT use, why should someone like myself, who is pro-public transport, vote for that policy? Thank you. Thank, thank you for your question. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll change the order. We'll start with Nicole, then Ave, and then Paul. So. Uh, the question was directed at me anyway, so that's good, that's, that's useful. Well, thank you for your question. And over the, the public transport policy, as I stated in my speech, Infrastructure Victoria, and I don't know if I have to bring up the report again, but I do have it, I thought I'd print it, so in case anyone wanted to have a look afterwards, has actually stated, not in here, but they have stated that this is one of their requests in order to help in all of these areas to drive emissions down, to have that mode shift from car dependency to public transport, they've requested that we lower the cost of the fares. So when we look at that cost of $1.3 billion that it's gonna cost over four years, it's not just about the, uh, the cost there, but it's about an investment. It's about an investment into public transport policy for the whole of Victoria. When you speak of public transport across Victoria, this is exactly what it is servicing. It's servicing every single seat in every part of Victoria. We've also talked about what we're doing for V-Line. I'm, I'm a big talker, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, to God. Hey. Thank you for your question. Um, as was just raised, cost of use of public transport is a factor, but also in this conversation it's essential to make public transport the most viable and enticing option, we have to talk about maintenance of service. We can't just talk about, and I'm not implying that we were just talking about it, but we can't just talk about how much it's going to cost to pay for your fare, but is this service dependable? Is it going to arrive on time? Is it consistent? Is it going to actually get me where I need to go? And is it a more viable option than a polluting car, for example? Um, these are really good questions to be raising. Um, and. Look, I look forward to having more discussions like on this on this front because it is a difficult thing. Cost is, is not enough to be discussing. While cost of living is a pressure, we have to actually have the long term view. What is the how are we using our existing services and where can it be improved? Thank you. Thanks, Eve. Next is Paul. Um, so if you look at the PTV annual report, the 2018-2019 annual report, um, there was almost a million dollars in fare box revenue that was raised. That is all hypothecated to the running of our public transport services. Um, it makes up approximately 30% of the total, uh, the total operating cost of uh, the public transport uh, fleet. Now, obviously, there has been a, a reduction in that. But even if we were to take a, uh, a conservative estimate and said, well, it's about half a, half a billion dollars that you're taking out um, of the fare box taking out of public transport services every single year. And I know that the announcement is about policy for four years, but what happens after that? 
I mean, once you, once you reduce the fares by 80%, do you put them back up by 400% after four years, or do you do that forever? That means that you're reducing that, um, in, that, that inflow of revenue into public transport forever and ever. Um, Nicole talked about the debt and deficit, but where is the money going to come other than the reduction of services? Thank you, Paul. Question from this side. Um, the, the woman right up the back here. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, my question is, as an EV owner, um, I just paid $400 to Vic Roads uh, for my 12 months of usage for EV tax. Um, the fuel excise collected by the federal government is uh, not hypothecated to roads. Uh, why is the government introducing and has introduced an EV tax based on kilometre usage um, when you're wanting to increase uptake on EVs? Thank you. Thank you for the question, uh, first respondent. Thank you, Ave. quite appropriate given the question. Um, one of the points that I did not raise in my six minute speech at the start is going to this election, we are asking to scrap Labor's EV tax. It does not make sense. If you want to have people transition to a more renewable vehicle, why would you make them pay more to do that? Which is then the opposite, our approach is we're talking about the eco bonus that I mentioned earlier to assist people with that immediate upfront cost of the transition. We need to be moving towards a more renewably powered Victoria on every front, not backwards. Thank you. Uh, so, already if you're an EV owner, you are getting um, uh, some reductions in terms of um, uh, uh, your, your, your stamp duty um, and, um, uh, and, and uh, Renewals, license renewals, or oh, not license renewals, but um, registration renewals. Um, as a as an EV owner, the and and the, the the rate is is less than what you would be paying at a, at a as a um, as a fuel excise. Um, in terms of the long term need for an EV uh, tax and EV an EV tax policy, um, we are we are going to see the take up of EVs regardless w w whether we like it or not. That is the way that the world is transitioning. Um, it is not just an environment co environmental cost that um, vehicles have. They have a social cost, they have a congestion cost on the roads. And that doesn't matter whether you're a, um, you're, you run an electric vehicle or you run a conventional vehicle. And I take your point that, the, that um, it's not um, hypothecated, but they are still put into the roads. Thanks, Paul. Nicole. Thanks for your question, Sally. And uh, to your point about the tax excise, it was a Liberal government that actually introduced that to help with the cost of living, which is something that we all are dealing with at the moment, uh, where we talk about, uh, I think your question was posed to the current state government, and I can't speak on behalf of them, so I won't pretend to or try to. But what I will say to us as a Liberal uh, government or seeking government uh, is that we are focused on EV in the sense of wanting to make sure that we have the grid that is ready, so that that demand on the grid is ready. And to that end, what we've done is we've announced a policy that we will introduce a rebate uh, for solar panels of $1,400, as well as for home batteries of $3,000. So uh, we want to encourage that electric vehicle usage in Victoria. So we're standing with you. Thanks, Nicole. All right, so I'm, I'm looking for a question from this side of the room. Um, the, the, the man in the red shirt. Thank you. Uh, I was just interested in what is the um, position of candidates where the um, party policy is against the wishes of the community and who you would support. Thank you for your question. And we'll start with Paul this time and, and go to Nicole afterwards. Uh, that's a very... Um broad general question. Um, I would say that uh, in my four years uh, I've always sought to represent and advocate for the constituents of Box Hill. That doesn't always mean that we get the outcome that every single constituent wants but and, and because ultimately the individual uh, representative, the individual member of parliament is not the, the ultimate decision maker on, on, on every infrastructure project. But um, I can, I can absolutely guarantee that every single moment that I have been um, in, in this position, I have fought tooth and nail to get 
everything for, as much as I can for this community and represent this community. Thank you, Paul and Nicole. I'll uh, leave it to the community to decide that for themselves when they come to vote on November 26th. But what I will say is that I stand with my community and I've been active every day ever since I've been pre-selected and before to advocate for our community and what challenges they face, whether it be small business owners and traders or whether it be residents that are having a station built right in front of their houses. Uh, so, look, where, where it pertains to your question, uh, I would be standing with my community first and foremost because that is your role as an elected representative of Parliament that you stand and represent your community. That is your job to serve them to your utmost beyond anything else. Thanks, Nicole. Eve. You're here. Um, when it comes to uh, the way that the Greens advocate going into whatever tier of government that we're able to do so. The idea is that everything we advocate for is in direct consultation with community. The points that I've raised tonight, that is similarly the case. Where is this crossing going to go? Where is this service going to be delivered? Is there community consensus with that? Greens operate from a basis of consensus, finding a meeting point, a middle ground to make sure that we take the community with us when we are integrating new policy into a reality for a, for a better, more prosperous Victoria. Um, it, in, in many ways, I think it's, it's antithetical to the idea of democracy to be delivering infrastructure, policy, outcomes, when there is significant community opposition. It does not make a lot of sense. So I think it's really crucial that we have events like tonight where we do get genuine feedback and actually take it on board and not just have this one-way flow of information and call it consultation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. So we've, we've had a range of questions and I was looking for one from a young person because we have two people who are um, probably under 18 and I'll, I'll, I'll go to you first. And from here on, I wonder if the audience might say your name and your suburb as well, just to give a, a sense of who you are and where you're from. Um, my name is Eleanor and I live in Montalbert. Nearly all of the trees on my street have been cut down for, an, for a huge new train station that will be right outside my home. The station building that will be outside my home will be so big that there will be no space to plant any new trees in front of the building. Why does this train station have to be so big? Thank you for your question. Well, thank you for your question, Ellen. I think out of the mouth of babes, uh, that was really profound and a really great question. I've been to that site many times and I can't actually give you an answer. You'd have to ask the current Labor government, so I'll leave that to them to answer. It's true. It's true. It is for the current government to answer that question. Uh, I think, as was raised earlier in my um, remarks, any new infrastructure, we have to take into account the ecological impact, the community impact, the social and cultural impact. We are on stolen land. Every decision we make that impacts country, the shape of it, the way that it, it continues in existence, our, our, the, the beings that were here before us, um, our, our flora, fauna, um, often very biodiverse and globally unique, we do need to make sure that we are taking into account their presence. And, and are, is this site going to be appropriately uh, what, what was offered in the site relocated to another location, has that concern been met? And, and I do hear this on North East Link, on Suburban Rail Loop, on all of the infrastructure projects going in from this state government across the board. It is a common community concern that is never adequately addressed from what I've seen. And so similarly, I'd like to hear answers. Thanks, Eleanor. So you asked why the station needs to be so big. When infrastructure is built, as in, as, as in the same way as any, if a, a house needs to be built, it has to be built to the current standards. You can't build it to the standards that applied 50 years ago or even 10 years ago. Um, the, the, current, uh, the current standards, particularly in terms of railway and railway stations, have certain dimensions in terms of the width of the platforms, and that's to allow for a full disability access and for movement of disability uh, um, uh, people in wheelchairs on the, on, on the platform. Um, uh, allowance for things such as such as uh, lifts as well. Um, the platforms also need to be straight, and they have to have a. There has to be certain widths be between um, each of the platforms so and between. The the yeah. No, she says the size. 
and, the, and the, the, the size of the station building also has um, is, is based on um, what requirements need to go in that building and because the building is going to be staffed and so it has to have certain facilities and each of those facilities have to have that size. Thank you, Paul. All right, um, I, I'm, I'm going to go and ask the, the, the other young... Uh, we have, we've had a question from a young woman, now from a young man. Go uh, ahead. Hello, I'm Adam from Vermont. Um, I'd like to talk about how CBD rail patronage seems to be returning, but the bounce back during the weekends has come much faster than the weekdays, with I believe the rate of offers in, um, in the CBD is like 56% now, but on the weekends, I was on a train the other day and it was full, there was no seats going out towards Whitehorse. Um, I know the Greens have got a policy to increase trains, but for some reason it ends at 7pm. Um, considering that, when will it be finally worth it to follow common sense to shift some resources from our peaks to evenings? Thank you for the question, Adam. And we'll start with Ave. Thank you for your question. I can promise you the trains don't stop at 7pm. Um, the conversation around particularly nighttime uh, frequency of train travel, that, that is still going to increase. And again, the, the long-term view towards the implementation of this particular type of policy is again responsive to what are the future um, usages, basically. As, you, as you've indicated, if we continue to see uptake in those given hours and they require more service, then the system needs to respond to that. And I would expect to see that on any given um, service-based infrastructure that we see going through in, in the long term in this state. So I think given the post-COVID environment, all of the different changes that have come into being in our, in our economy in Victoria, uh, we do need to continually reassess what is actually currently useful, what is, what is practical for the community. I know out my way, um, the nighttime frequency of trains, sometimes you have to wait at least an hour for the train. And so really we do need to, irrespective um, of, of the long term that I'm talking about, we are definitely looking to see an increase in frequency in those hours. I'm glad you raised the question. Thanks, Steve. Paul. Thanks. I'd, I'd be in broad agreement with uh, with that answer. Actually, I think that there's uh, there's always an opportunity to look at um, new service uh, offerings, particularly in the off peak areas, off peak times, because it doesn't require additional uh, additional rolling stock, um, and, and you don't, it doesn't require the additional infrastructure. Um, when the when the um, level crossings are removed, uh, the there'll obviously need to be a, a timetable uh, refresh. Um, and hopefully as part of that, uh, the, the, the department can have a look at um, service levels, not only just at um, uh, during the peak time, but also about what's happening more, recent, more, more, more recently and then accommodate those services with, uh, with evening and, uh, and weekend services as well. That's great. Thanks for your question, Adam. Um, Look, uh, I'm a local too, so I know the same feeling when I get on a train and go into the city, it's pretty empty, but then when it's a weekend or when the footy was on and you go into the city, it's packed. So I get that. We've got to look at why there is this challenge with the CBD being empty. We've got to look at the root reason of that, and the root reason of it, the truth is, that lockdown after lockdown, six lockdowns later, after the world's longest lockdowns, people were no longer travelling into the city. People didn't have that confidence to travel into the city and when there were the restrictions on working in your office and instead having to work from home, that means that people, there isn't that patronage into the city on the weekdays because people are opting for another choice and part of the $2 public transport policy is so that there is uh, an incentive for people to use public transport again so that we can drive traffic back into the city, drive the economy back into the city, spend, uh, drive spending back into the city once again. And so to answer your question on that, that's our plan for it. Thanks, Nicole. I'm, I'm going to go to that side of the room and uh, the... the, 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 the the uh, councillor, Amanda yeah. McNeil. Yeah, well, Would you like to ask a question? Yes, thank you. Just a very quick one. With the trains following uh, sporting events, why is it that we get literally three, three trains to, uh, to, to um, uh, Glen Waverley and, and while the platform at Richmond overflows with people wanting to come out to uh, Belgrave and Lilydale? Why hasn't the state government fixed this problem? Thank you. 
Thank you, Councillor McNeill. We'll start this time with Paul. Oh, thanks, Councillor. I'm, I'm not quite sure if that's um, that's actually the reality. I would have. Um, I would be pretty confident that the that the number of services that they're putting on after the footy um, would be would be both Glen Waverley and uh, Belgrave Lilydale line trains. Um, that certainly would be my experience. So many more, many more Glen Waverley trains. I think after the after the footy. Well, they don't usually. They often don't um, uh, publish the footy specials, but they they still actually run them. Okay. Well, we can. Uh, I, I can. I can certainly take that up for next uh, for the next footy season, and well, what the events that we have for the rest of the year, which are, uh, I mean, there's the World Cup. Well, it's actually Australian Open, uh, World Cup, cricket, um, and, uh, and and other and other cricket events. So we can we can look into that in more detail. Thanks, Paul. Nicole. Uh, again, what I'm interested in is the systemic reason or the root reason of why this would be the case. And Amanda, I've consulted with experts like Peter Parker, and I know Sebastian, who's a, a local in the room, contacted me, uh, never heard from him before, uh, to ask about my views on transport and transport policy. I know he's a big fan, and if you're a transport buff, you would be too. And we talked extensively about the fact that our transport system hasn't been updated or upgraded to reflect the different usage in 30 years. There are some buses in our state presently that still don't run on Sundays because Sunday buses, uh, sorry, you weren't allowed to trade on a Sunday, but of course that was deregulated in 1996 when I was five years old. So we know that we need to update and do better so that our services reflect the needs of our community. That's what we plan to do if we win government and that's what we will do. Thanks, Nicole. Dave. That point we just ended on is spot on. The services do need to reflect the community and the actual usage and, and the, what's been described um, tonight has to actually be listened to. And I, and I do detect a bit of a disconnect from the sitting member and the lived experience of the people in the room, which is always a bit worrying to see. That said, I do appreciate it's good that, that you've managed to come down. I did one of these last week in Banyul where there was no Labor representative because they wouldn't front up to the room. So we do need to make sure that we are having this two-way flow of information and that what is being reported is not then gaslit as not being correct. Like, evidently, there is some middle ground in the information here that we do need an improvement in service and that requires a further conversation. Thank you for your question. Thanks, Eve. All right, um, the man with the check shirt. Yeah. Yeah, Michael from uh, Blackburn. Um, could, could I ask you to speak into the mic, please? Yeah. Michael from Blackburn. Um, last year I attended the one day when SRL put their plans in front of what they were intending to do. They were very confident people. They possessed a lot of competence too, I expect. I'm not particularly worried about the uh, Underground Railway. That's, um, I'm part of the uh, discount rate, I think, and it won't be my problem to go on them or whatever, or even pay for them. But what I am concerned about, as a former CEO of Box Hill Hospital, is the road system that is being talked about for Box Hill. I don't know that people are aware that the SRL people plan for Box Hill, and they are the planners now for Box Hill, not Box Hill Whitehorse Council. Uh, anyway, what, what is being planned is a reduction of Whitehorse Road going through, Black, uh, through Box Hill and to two lanes each way. And the question now, I'm concerned. Uh, about, you, yes, I am going to make a, a real point, and it's an important one. Uh, yes, I, I know. No, but, but, it concerns but, my previous job. People are waiting, sir. And you yes, I understand. Please ask your question. Well, now. Let, please let me say what I need to say. If the road is reduced to two lanes each way, I'd like to know how the ambulances in an emergency service are going to get to Box Hill or to Epworth Eastern. I think it is badly planned, and Paul, I do wish that you would con the people who are doing this would consult with the community the planning for the SRL as far as it is concerned with Box Hill, and this area is absolutely absent. The, the 
papers that we have now literally can, uh, are the age or the, or the sun. There is no local paper and there is no communication about what is being talked about for this area. And it's bloody serious. You want to consult with people, do so. Um, the, the, the next one is Nicole. Thank you for your question. And Nicole. Yeah, uh, well, Michael, if I can start off uh, first by saying thank you for your insight and expertise. Uh, it is really important that we do consult with the community at large, but also experts like yourself who have worked as the former CEO. I didn't know we had you in, your, in our midst uh, of Box Hill Hospital. And that's what we commit to do. That's what I've been doing. I've been out with my community every single day, consulting with them, speaking with them, looking at what better options and outcomes there can be. And for the SRL specifically, you've heard from us that we'll shelve it so it won't be an issue for in government. Uh, as for the planning of the roads, again, that's, that's an issue for uh, the Labor government to have to uh, be held to account for. Uh, but what I will say is that we stand with our community, we're going to serve our community and we will fight so that we make sure these services are available because they are essential and particularly Box Hill Hospital that, that we put that funding into it because we must make sure that people, if they ring an ambulance, that it will come for them and if they go to Box Hill Hospital, they'll be attended to. Thanks, Nicole. Hi. Thank you for your question and thank you for your advocacy on this issue and for raising it in a space like this and really going to that effort. Um, it's really critical that in a process for a massive piece of infrastructure like the one we're talking about with the rail loop, for example, um, or I'm seeing the same issue right out north in North East Link, that the actual, the, the design, the implementation, the process of what is going to occur and what is the outcome for this project is completely transparent and clear to the community so they can see the rationale, they can see the full scope of what's going on so that they are Firstly, any concerns are assuaged, but also so they can understand why the government is doing so in their interest. And I do also want to hear the answer to your question that you've raised, because the fact that it is coming up tonight worries me. I, I do think we need to, with any given infrastructure, assess how it broadly interacts with the, with the health sector, with the broader um, community and systems that are going on around it. It needs to all work hand in hand. Thank you. Yeah, um, I thank you for your question as well. The, the Suburban Rail Loop, um, the documentation of, on that project is probably the most extensive that I've ever seen. Um, it's still all available online. All of the information was uh, made public through the Environmental Effects Statement, which people did have the opportunity to comment on. Um, so. So I, I, I take I take that aboard. I thought it was was four weeks, but that the that the, the, the <laughs> comment was. But um, okay. Well, I guess I know there was a lot of I know there was a lot of documentation. That's what I that is what I said. What I what I what I what I can offer what I can offer is I'm happy to take your details um, and and ask the. Um, SRL team to get in contact with you directly. It's so obviously the the um, lane widths on either side of Whitehorse Road are either two lanes or in some areas um, west of Elga Road are obviously uh, down to one lane um, in, in parts. So that was obviously the assessment, the two lanes, but I'm happy to, if I can get your details afterwards and I can ask SRL the SRL team to look in more detail with you. Th thank you, Paul. All right, and just to reiterate the, the rules of the forum, this is an opportunity to ask questions of the candidates. It's, it's not a town hall interchange, um, so I'll, I'll be keeping to time where I can. No, and, and I apologise for, for shutting you down as well, because um, you, you're an evidently um, eminent member of the community, and I thank you for your question. I'm going to move to this side of the room now, and to, to the woman at the back, please. Thank you to give me the uh, chance. I just wanted to support the first question the lady raised. And I also wanted to um, really play the uh, Labour and the Liberal, two major parties. Don't play your power. And please take our money carefully 
and use our money uh, wisely to the community and just don't play, um, extend, please extend your visions, not just uh, focus on the four years power. That is my comment. Thank you. So I, I'll take that as a comment, I think, um, if, if, you, if you're con content with leaving it as a comment. And we'll, we'll, we'll move on. I'm going to go to this side of the room and the, 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 the man in the grey. My name's Scott uh, from Mont Albert. Uh, the current government has introduced uh, regulatory amendments in relation to the planning scheme where it's reporting to itself. So it's, uh, any project is effectively reporting to the planning minister. It's hiding uh, studies and reports around projects <clears throat> under a ministerial uh, cape and affected members of the community are not able to access that. When we look at uh, major projects such as the SRL and we have uh, an EES that is being conducted, it's excluding the 1.6 kilometre radius that the government is also taking planning control over. Moving forward, how can we ensure, ensure that there is some level of decency, transparency and democracy associated with these projects? Thank you, and it's an excellent question. Um, I think we need to always see independent oversight from the undertakings of government. I think in, in a lot of ways, the current situation politically in Victoria is that we have this majority Andrews government and there is not enough room across the board to hold it to account. I say this also from my perspective as running for the upper house where we're working against a system that effectively stacks uh, uh, power for the uh, majority Labor government rather than having a true representation of um, what is a more proportionate um, a uh, grouping of members. I, I say that my seat was previously Samantha Dunn, a Green, and we lost it due to the group voting ticket legislation, but I won't go into that because it's transport forum. Um, we need to make sure that there is always transparency and clarity on decisions that are made regarding transport, particularly when they're this huge scale that we are talking about. And I mean, it's, it's great that you've managed to ask this question here tonight because that, that offers some, hopefully, degree of accountability from the sitting member but we need to make sure that it doesn't come to that. We need to see it from the get-go every time. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. And I'll, I'll just um, want to, um, I suppose, focus on the, the 1.6 kilometre one that you, that you referenced. Um, so as it stands at the moment, those precinct plans haven't even been drawn up. So the process that was... Um, pr proposed and has, was um, uh, endorsed through the through the EES process and through the the um, planning approval process was that um, that precinct planning process would be a collaboration between council community and um, and the state government to develop um, to develop those those precinct plans. Um, so, that, I mean, you, you, I, I understand that you'd be, you, you want to see the, uh, the, the, that in reality and see how that actually uh, event, eventuates, but I think the, 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 the process for that project um, is there to allow that to happen. And it's the same as what happened in, um, in Arden, and which, is, which you can see all, all online. I hope that was a sufficient answer to your question, Scott. Uh, but what I will say on that is that uh, 1.6 kilometre square radius is 800 hectares, hectares rather. So that is something that is terrifying for the seat of Box Hill, the electorate in both ends where there will be the Burwood station as well as the Box Hill station, that it would cover so much of our electorate. There, there are these, it's a blank check kind of uh, system where they're able to just get away with anything. And so to that end, what we have said is that we will have open and transparent government, that we will produce the, the, the findings so that we will have the plans available and not block the, even the council from seeing them, which has been the case at Union Station. Not even council has seen those plans. Not even the residents. The residents cannot see that. 
So they've been asking, I've got a thread of emails from one of the residents asking the LXRP, are they able to see the plans again? And they've been rebuffed time and time again. Now, that's what we promised. And one of those things where we're going to put our money where our mouth is, we'll fund our back. Um, the, the man in the glasses, yeah. Hi. I have, sorry, I haven't met you. Nice to meet you. Um, I'm a trader at Mount Albert. I've spoken to both Nicole and Paul quite a few times. One of the things that we've noticed um, is the general lack of any empathy or sympathy or discussion with the traders. So at the moment, we've got um, issues with a downturn of 35% across 90% of the traders. And when the roads are shut, it's at 60%. I found that today, sadly, that two of the traders in, in Surrey Hills will close by December and four others are not renewing their leases, which are early next year. We have come to everyone and said, look, it shouldn't be that we bear the cost of you cutting a ribbon at the end of an event, which seems to be the case. Glorified, you know, dangerous, congested. We'll get a train station there, but um, we'll cut a ribbon, look great. But the price that is being paid in all 78 projects has been far too high. So I, I don't want to lose my livelihood, and I'm considering my options as well. You need to help, and you need to do it now, and you need them to consult. In the terms of spending $700 million on a project, it's a cup of coffee's worth of money to keep the traders going. How about someone offer it? And we'd like to know who's going to offer it. Uh, well, thanks, thanks, Peter. And like you said, we have had um, a number of discussions, and I've, I've uh, had a number of discussions with traders um, over the time in both um, Hamilton Street and Union Road, and uh, I, I, uh, I think I, I well understand the issues that they're that they're going through, um, and that that has been um, uh, re repeatedly uh, relayed um, up through the minister's office to see what can be done. I don't have anything to promise tonight. Well, I know you, the, the solution that you're looking for, um, and at, at this stage, I don't have anything that, uh, that that we're going to that I can announce tonight. Um, I know what's what's ahead for, for the traders, and um, that I'll, I'll, all I can uh, promise is that I'll I'll uh, keep working and keep advocating for the traders. Thanks, Paul. Nicole. All communication to the ministers in relation to that have been ignored. Nicole. That is correct. All communications to the Minister for Small Business have been ignored from this current government. And in the meantime, we were there on the day that the traders, as in myself, the Shadow Minister for Small Business, as well as the candidate for Hawthorne, John Pursuto, were there that day where the traders formed their association. We've been there every step of the way. I've brought out Senator Jane Hume from the federal uh, government, I've, uh, rather from our federal team. Uh, she was the federal government. Uh, I've brought out uh, Ryan Smith, our shadow planning minister. I have been actively and aggressively pursuing and advocating a solution for traders. I've been at their door every single day, I can assure you that, Peter. Now, while I can't, I, while I can't make a promise on the, the, uh, the compensation that I know you are after, I can say, and I've said this to you privately, I'm happy to say it publicly today, that we have promised and we are committed to putting $200,000 into Union Station, $200,000 into Hamilton Street and Mont Albert to revitalise the shopping strips as part of our plan to revitalise shopping strips across Melbourne and across Victoria. Now, I know that's not what you're wanting, but it's a start. Thanks, Eve. Thank you. It's, it's a really critical point you're raising, this idea of when we have infrastructure that is put in place, that it intersects with the community in a way that everyone is better off. We can't have a situation where some are left to the side in order for the project to be rolled out. If it's a matter of cost, and I know often this can be the case, I can point towards the sources by which we're looking to fund our new measures that I've already spoken about tonight, increased levy placed on the big banks, on the um, gambling industry and property developers. There are measures that can be taken to make sure that everyone is looked after when we are rolling out massive infrastructure like this. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So we're, we're at uh, 7.39 and we've probably got 
time for three more questions. I'm, I'm going to continue to alternate sides of the room, and I'm going to go way up the back this time and um, go to the man with the blue jumper on. Thank you, Francis Lin. My question is to Paul. Paul, in relation to uh, SRL, are you sure we can afford it? Where is the government going to get the money from? And how much interest that we are going to pay for? Especially last year, we had Moody reduce our triple A rating to double A1. And this year again, double A2. This is an indication of they are very concerned, the government management of our money. Thank you for the question. Um, it was a question to Paul, but uh, all candidates will respond if they choose. And the first respondent is Nicole. Uh, look, what I will say is that I'm extremely concerned about the debt. And as you said, the SRL, where will the money come from? I don't know when we are in 100... Sorry, I think I misquoted myself earlier. It's $167.5 billion debt that we are in, where we're paying $6 billion interest every single year. So when you ask whether or not that's a financially wise decision, whether or not that we'll be able to afford it. I would love to hear an answer myself. Thank you for your question. Um, I think it comes down to an idea of transparency. We, it, yeah, the question is where, where does the money come from, as was just raised? That needs to be communicated to the constituency of this area and broader Victoria, because that has to be factored in for the community, like acknowledging what is this going to cost and how is that being budgeted, generally speaking, because when we come forth to November 26, we have to have that at the back of our mind when we are making our vote, that we have some clear long-term vision as to what they're particularly coming out of the COVID pandemic, what the path is. We need to see that as a community. So thank you for your question. So, yeah, thank you for your question. So just in terms of the SRL, so um, the the project that has been, or that the government is committing to, is SRL East. Um, similarly to other projects like the Ring Road, for example, uh, no government committed to building the entire Ring Road, including the North East Link, uh, prior to when, when they started building the Western Ring Road back in the back in the 80s. Um, the, so the commitment to the SRL East is about $35 billion, of which a third is um, intended to come from the state. Now, on a on a year by year basis. Uh, that represents about $750 million a year in infrastructure spend, or about 5% of, uh, of, of, the, of the state's um, infrastructure budget. If you talk about general affordability, if you, if you look at the, the debt to um, uh, gross state product ratio, that's far less than where the Commonwealth is at the moment, so, and, and had been where um, at, the, at, at the election. So, uh, I mean, the affordability is, I guess, one for the the, uh, the economists, but our, our debt to GDP ratio, uh, GSP ratio, is still very low. It's lower than national, and that's lower than most international countries at the moment. Thank you, Paul. Um, we're going to go to that side, and uh, I'll I'll go to the the woman here. The woman. <laughs> to you, madam, is is the, that woman? Yeah. Please ask your question. I've got so many. <laughs> I've got so many. Oh, well, one question. Okay, so um, what is our city going to look like in 30 years' time? Good question, Paul, that you posed. So suburban rail loop is as much a planning project as it is a rail project. People touched on the 1.6 kilometre precinct zones. Does everybody know what that means? It means that there is no more wider council. It means... So, <laughs> this, isn't, this isn't discussed. It's not in the glossy brochures. What's going to happen is that suburbs such as Surrey Hills and Mont Albert are going to be greatly impacted. Um, and you talk about cost, a third coming from the state. Where's the rest coming from? Land development, 1.6 kilometre precinct zones, increased density, suburbs like Surrey Hills and Mont Albert. I don't even think <laughs> residents know. As I said, it's not in the glossy brochures. So when are you going to... When are we going to discuss... When is the state government going to tell us exactly about the planning of this um, the suburban rail loop? Thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, I would love to hear what the answer ends up being on this question. Um, 
the, it, I keep coming back to it tonight, but this idea of genuine flow of communication in both directions so that the community is up to speed on what actually is being implemented, not, and I, we see this, I keep mentioning North East Link, which is closer to where I live, we, we always see the glossy brochure, but we need to see actual detail and not, well, we were talking about a 30,000 page document before, in a way that is actually digestible and clear to the community. It is unfair to do otherwise. In a democracy, that surely should be a bare minimum that we are actually all able to be up to speed in a clear, plain language way on what is actually being implemented, what the impacts are, what the concerns are, what's it going to cost, every factor. So I thank you for your question and I hope we get a great answer. Uh, thanks, Yvonne. And uh, I'm not sure if the uh, two minutes or whichever the timeline I have can actually do, uh, do justice to, uh, to, uh, to answer your, your question in its entirety. Um, so. The, the, the 1.6 kilometre um, uh, uh, precinct plan, as I, as I described in my previous answer, um, that's a, a next stage to the process, which is it's always been said that it will involve um, the state government, the council and the community to, uh, and, it's, and it's part of a, what, will, what will effectively develop like a developer contributions plan and work out what um, what infrastructure is required in that site. At the moment, if you do a development, developments are occurring in that area as we speak. Right? All of them have been approved by council, generally. Some, some of them not approved and then go to, go to VCAT, but it's all been a council decision. The SRL hasn't been changing whether the, whether, whether the plans get approved or not. But the contributions that come from um, uh, those, those plans and those developments, um, they're, they're, they're not captured and, and, and given back to the community. So um, as I referred to previous in one of the previous answers, the, the Arden Precinct, I think, is a good example. Obviously, that was a, a, a brownfield site, but in terms of the process that went through with council, with the community, to get the infrastructure outcomes uh, within that area. Thanks, Paul. Nicole. Well, we'll have to continue moving on and, and to, to, to give Nicole a chance to respond. I'm happy to leave it at that. Okay, so Nicole forfeits the time, which gives us time for one more question and I, I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll go to you, Amanda, if you'd like to ask the final audience question and then we have one from the viewers at home as well. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Cynthia Pilly. For transparency, I'm planning to stand as a candidate in Warrandyte District on a platform, platform of more rail, not roads. In the age today, there is an article titled Climate crisis is the looming cloud. The author says it is impossible to think about the unprecedented, unprecedented nature of our recent floods without mentioning the climate crisis. He goes on to say, so as a hydrologist, I think the recent floods are a reminder that we need to learn how to better live with floods and we urgently need to reduce our carbon emissions. Given the growing urgency across the country to address climate change, would you embrace Transurban's mega North East Link toll road instead of rail, were it proposed now, given it is the most expensive toll road project Victoria has ever embarked and the most environmentally destructive project in the decade? Thank you for your question, and we'll, we'll start with Paul. North East Aqueduct, actually. <laughs> Cynthia, uh, thanks for your, your question. Um, I think, uh, I mean, I, in my in my initial out, uh, my, my my initial presentation, I, I did mention about um, our our population growth and where we'll be in uh, in 30 years' time, uh, and I think we need to have the transport infrastructure to accommodate that, and that means road infrastructure, and that also means the rail infrastructure. So we we as a as a growing city, we we need to um, be able to get around, and and a and, and a rail option won't be an option for everyone. I mean, we rely a lot on on freight to to move um, to move goods around, and also people to get from for, uh, to to their jobs that are not accessible by public transport. Um, so, in 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 answer, I think notwithstanding what's gone on in the last two years, we still need both um, uh, investment in road infrastructure and rail infrastructure. 
Thanks, Cynthia, for your question. Uh, I uh, have spoken or rather alluded to some of our climate policy uh, in this coming election and it's something we actually do prioritise and certainly I do as a young person at 31 years of age uh, and the world I'm going to inherit from uh, our forebearers. So it's something I'm interested in absolutely. Uh, in answer to your question, uh, I might go back to the $2 public transport policy that we have. Part of the very reason that we are doing that is, and if you're a transport buff, I know the word mode shift is a buzzword in the space. We want to promote and increase that mode shift away from people having that car dependency so that they are able to use public transport. Part of incentivising it is for that very reason. We have that report from Infrastructure Victoria amongst all my papers that says that it will reduce emissions. And so uh, to that end, that's why we're doing that policy. Thank you for your question. And I, I will note we actually have our Greens candidate for Warrandyte here in the front row, so it'll be good to get you to talk to each other after this. Um, North East Link, the Greens have opposed since the beginning. It incentivises car travel, particularly right now polluting car travel, pre the EV boom, uh, when we should be incentivising public transport and other means of transport that don't harm the planet. I, I speak to constituents about North East Link specifically regularly because it is closer to where I am based and there has been health concerns from people living nearby. There's concern about how what happens in the long term. We add all these lanes and then, you know, 10 years goes by and all the lanes are full again. Then what do we do? Do we add more lanes? It's not a long-term form of thinking. Realistically, I think it was ill-formed on the mindset that we needed to deal with growth. Yes, we need to deal with growth. How are we doing that, though? Is it in a way that's sustainable for the environment, that's going to sustain our community? Currently, Watsonia is being ripped in half. Unfortunately, we're looking at this election where it's likely we're going to see a return of the Andrews government. So the question I pose to everyone is, what can we do to hold that government to account on issues like the one you've raised? Thank you for standing. Thank you. All right. Um, so so we, we got to 15 questions, uh, one comment, and a final question from the viewers at home. Yeah, this is a question from a woman who rang me today. Um, her name's Margaret Tonkin. She's from Box Hill. And she couldn't be here because the bus services aren't good at night for her. So that's why I've lobbied to have this one asked. As a user of public transport, including local bus trains and sometimes trams, is it possible to have a timetable reference board of the departure times of buses that use the Box Hill Terminal on the ground floor of the Southern Pre Precinct? Now, I guess this just addresses the whole question of how do we get the different modes to interact and how do people know that they interact? So that's the question for the... What will the candidates do about it? Thank you, Greg. So, so that's Margaret's question. The first response will come from Nicole. Go ahead. Uh, if I can, hopefully Margaret's, Margaret's watching online, thank you for your question. And if I can refer back to what I spoke about earlier about the uh, usage of public transport and rather it not being adapted to, uh, to be updated to keep up with the needs of today. Uh, that's something that we have pushed for. One of our policies that we've come out with is uh, the Glen Waverley, as I mentioned, to Box Hill bus service that will run every 10 minutes uh, during these high frequency hours and every 15 minutes otherwise. And so it's with services like this that we're able to provide the service delivery that our community needs. So thank you for raising that. If I am to be successful, I'll certainly uh, follow that up and make sure that we have that ready because we do want that accessibility to be able to uh, use the public transport and for every type of person, it, it actually breaks my heart to think that Margaret wasn't able to be here tonight just because she couldn't get on a bus that would come on time uh, or find what time the bus was coming. That's your bare back basics, really, of the Department of Transport. And if we're not doing that well enough, then it needs to change. Thank you for this question. And I agree it is a shame that you weren't able to join us tonight because of this issue. Um, I think genuine consultation when it comes to what we want the future of our transport to look like in this state needs to involve genuine person-to-person -person conversations like the questioner that we've just heard from. Where, what mode of transport do you use to get, go to the shops? How do you get to work? What would you like to see? A large pileup of conversations like those should inform what actual services we provide the community. And evidently in this case, what we have done has, has let the questioner fall through 
the cracks effectively and we have a, what is not a great outcome. It should be that if I want to go somewhere, I can use a non-polluting form of transport to get there, one that is ideally public, one that is accessible and usable by everyone at low cost. Thanks for your question. Uh, thank you, and thanks, Margaret, for, for your question as well. Um, service levels are probably the most important determinant in, um, in, in facilitating a mode shift. So as, as, uh, as I alluded to earlier, I mean, $109 million is the state government has put into uh, improving local bus services in, this, um, uh, in, in the, the last budget alone, and uh, that will include upgrades to services between Box Hill and Deakin Uni, as well as on uh, um, some of the other north-south uh, routes heading down from, from Box Hill. Um, improving, improving services is, is really key, and then improving information to uh, to access those services, whether that's on a digital platform or uh, on, a, on, a, on a static platform, so that people can find um, find, find their their um, their service easily, know when it's going to come. I mean, any any um, any ideas, any ways that that can improve, um, that that's something that I'm always going to be uh, advocating for because that's that's how we are going to shift people to public transport to to make it easier. Um, and quicker for them to use. Thank you, Paul. And th that concludes our Q&A segment. Th thank you all for those excellent questions, informed by e evidence and, and passion, um, with a ro wide range of ages, backgrounds, genders, and thank you to our young people for contributing as well. We've come to the, the time where we sum up, and we'll now invite the panellists to make final remarks for up to two minutes, but no longer. And this time we'll reverse the order from before. As you recall, um, Nicole went first, then Ave, and then Paul. So the new order will be Paul first, then Ave, and then we'll finish with Nicole. I invite you, Paul, to come up to the microphone and to make closing remarks to the audience for no more than two minutes. Well, thank you for, for all for your, your time this evening and for your, for your questions. As I, as I started off and as I did in my presentation, this, this, um, this election is, is about the future and particularly if we're talking about transport infrastructure and transport services and what our transport is going to be in the, in the future. We, I, I asked you not to look at the next four years, but I asked you to look at where you've been in, in, in 20 or 30 years and what city we're going to have um, and how we, how we want to get around. So do we want to be a more environmentally friendly city? Do we want to have the public transport options that will enable us to, um, yeah, to, to, to go from place to place without actually going um, into the city? Do we, ha do we want to have the services in place and the, uh, the, 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 I guess the revenue stream for those services to actually deliver increased services every year to match the um, the population growth, um, putting in bus services and, and increased train services um, as we deliver the infrastructure. We're delivering the infrastructure not for the sake of delivering the infrastructure. The infrastructure is there so we can deliver the services that the people that people need to get to to get to jobs, to get to jobs quicker, get to uh, and, and get to education services, health services, and all the other services that are that are, that are, um, that, that that we rely on. Um, we, as I, as I mentioned previously, level of service is, is probably the most important element in determining whether someone will shift their mode. It, it, it's not about um, the, it, it's, it's less about the, the, um, the, the, the fare, it's much more about the level of service and the travel time. Study after study after study show that that is the case. And if we, if we don't invest in the the services, if we don't invest in the infrastructure that is going to allow those services to run, um, we, we will be left with that population growth and not be able to service it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. Next is Ave. Thank you, everyone, for your excellent questions tonight and for showing up and, and holding us to account by, by making your remarks. Um, as was just raised, we need to think about what a future of Victoria looks like, one that hopefully doesn't trash the planet in the means of getting about our day-to-day -day lives. 
when it comes to public transport, as has just been talked about, we need to raise service and make sure that it is um, accessible and the most enticing option, but that has to take the community on board with it as well. Consultation needs to be two-way, needs to be in good faith, needs to be genuine, and when concerns are raised, they need to be listened to and addressed. It should not come to the eve of an election for that to take place, and that's if that's going to happen, I'll point out. You need to get to the ballot box, either early voting or November 26, and genuinely think, has my voice been heard by my representative or by my candidate? And does that represent the future of Victoria that I want to see? Thank you all for having me tonight. Thank you, Ave. Nicole. Well, thank you so much for your time tonight. We have heard from a variety of people across the electorate, whether it be Scott in Mont Albert with his concerns about the SRL regulatory amendments to the planning scheme, whether it be Peter, a small business owner and trader who's concerned whether or not his business will be able to stay open ongoing, whether it be Michael, the former CEO of Box Hill Hospital, who is concerned about the access to roads to the hospital because of the SRL. We have heard from these questions that our community is not being heard. The issues that you're raising about community consultation, about transparency and integrity, about the, the fact that you feel like you're not being listened to and that you have not been represented. That's my takeaway from tonight. You've heard firsthand that we, the Liberals, have a plan for transport and we have a plan for Box Hill. You have my commitment that as your voice for Box Hill, I will continue to listen, genuinely listen to our community and to fight for what matters to you and to be a genuine and real representative for you in Parliament. Thank you. And that's right on eight o'clock. I'd, I'd, I'd like to invite you to show your warm appreciation for our candidates who spoke tonight. I'd, I'd also like to, to thank a, a few others who helped make tonight possible, including Greg Day, the organiser, um, Brad Every, who ran the cameras and the live streaming, Jane Waldock, our executive officer of the Metropolitan Transport Forum, Chris Hui, who's the strategic transport planner for the city of Whitehorse, and finally, the the host councillors, we had Councillor Andrew Munro and Councillor Amanda McNeil, our gracious hosts. Please thank all of those people. <laughs> and, and, and finally, on behalf of the MTF and Whitehorse Council, I'd like to thank you all for being here tonight. You know, it's, it, it takes commitment, drive, passion, and you have that in spades. Thank you for making the thriving democracy of Whitehorse a viable one, and thank you for being here tonight. I've been Jonathan Marsden for the Metropolitan Transport Forums. Thank you, and good night. <laughs>